Today I'm going to um, talk a bit on a high level instead of uh, component level. Uh, and this talk is not only limited to neural networks. I'll try to give you an idea about uh, where we stand today as a medical imaging community in terms of applications of machine learning, uh, what are the current limitations, and what we can actually uh, achieve with these tools. And I'm going to cover uh, various topics. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to talk about myself. And I think I've got an R. So please feel free to interrupt me any anytime you want if you have any questions. Um, I probably have like 50 slides in my slide deck. And uh, I'll first talk about the academic work and then I'll touch a bit on the uh, uh, industry part. So I started working on medical imaging about about seven years ago, uh, back in uh, Siemens Corporate Research in, in New Jersey. And before that, I, I was uh, at EPFL in Lausanne uh, doing information theory and uh, computer vision. So the first time I started medical imaging, uh, I worked on laparoscopic surgeries and started playing with uh, uh, random forest kind of models. At that time, MSR uh, proposed these techniques, and it was the early times of applications of machine learning in medical uh, domain. And then after successful publications in Mikai, um, I moved to London to do my PhD there. And I'm still affiliated with the college. Uh, it's a boy media lab uh, you're seeing on the top. We have about uh, 40 members uh, in the group. And we specialize in machine learning tools and their uh, applications in the domain. And at the same time, I'm working as a uh, full-time uh, research lead at HeartFlow. Um, it's a, it's a medical tech company based in Silicon Valley, and we specialize in uh, coronary arteries uh, uh, detection, disease in the coronary arteries. And today, I will basically talk about how we actually uh, pr uh, design research solutions and what is the journey to put these solutions into a clinical software to help um, radiologists uh, to ease their task and how, like, how can we actually improve the uh, clinical workflow. I personally specialize in design and implementation of machine learning models. So that's what I've been doing uh, for a while. Uh, so first of all, like is this today's agenda? I'll talk about where we stand in machine learning models, and then there will be applications uh, like image segmentation. I'm sure many of you know, uh, and that will follow up image registration, some inverse problems. Uh, don't worry if you don't know what it is. Uh, I'll talk about it. And then I'll present some uh, relatively newish uh, research outputs related to attention modeling. And at the end, I'll talk about the hard flow of our work. So um, the AI hype uh, started in our domain uh, about three, four years ago um, when we basically started using our neural network models uh, back in the days. And since then, uh, we have been seeing um, journal articles um, claiming that uh, these models can actually achieve uh, human level or annotator level uh, performance. And there's always a misconception of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in our domain. Uh, so I basically would like to claim that they're quite different topics and uh, we need to understand uh, the dis differences uh, between the two quite well to be able to move on uh, to come up with better solutions. So what are these differences? Uh, to me, machine learning models or the neural networks are actually not much different than what we used to do back in the days, like support vector machines or uh, random forest. But they are powerful tools in terms of uh, learning uh, representations and defining the, the training objectives the way we want. But they're still quite error prone. For example, many of you might know the uh, adversarial attacks on the uh, classification models. These models tend to be quite sensitive to perturbations in the image domain. Um, if the input data coming is different than the distribution of the training data, uh, that might trigger completely different results. And we may not uh, rely on such kind of systems uh, in a clinical practice. So how can we actually avoid these kind of problems and uh, design more robust solutions? Or the other problem you might have encountered or may encounter in the future is to be able to solve a, a trivial task we often require very large data sets. So for example, we're looking at this, uh, this cardiac MR image, and we're seeing the uh, semantic segmentation of uh, the ventricles. If you analyze three or four cases, 
I'm sure many of us uh, will be able to extrapolate this knowledge to many images, and we can annotate thousands of images. More or less, it will be accurate. But why does it take so much effort to teach that to model? Like, why do we need many samples? Um, I think we need to understand it, and how can we actually get there? Like, that will be the research that we need to focus on. And on top of the, uh, the intensity distributions, uh, one thing we might need to focus on is how can we deal with the differences in acquisition protocols and uh, how can we actually make sure that one model can be generalized to many different uh, scanner types and uh, clinical sites, which is often not the case. Once we design a model for one particular site, it doesn't always apply to a different sites. So these are main problems that we're facing at the moment. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they're, good at, they're quite good at uh, some tasks. So uh, a few examples are when the domain is uh, quite constrained, when we know that the input data distribution does not show large variation, they're quite powerful, they're reproducible. Uh, every time we run these models, we know what we're gonna get at the end. And they can scale up to thousands of images because inference time is usually in the order of uh, seconds when we use standard uh, feedforward to vanilla networks. And often we can achieve average annotator performance as long as the label quality is good. And the label quality defines the upper bound of these models uh, most of the time. So I'll give you a quick example about like, what I've been talking about. So this is a very trivial task uh, nowadays. Uh, first, there has been a challenge uh, in Kaggle uh, back in 2016, and then there was this ACDC challenge uh, organized by uh, Olivier and his group uh, on cardiac MRME segmentation. Uh, probably you know what we're doing here is basically what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to classify every image pixel uh, on a dense level. So this is called image segmentation problem, and the objective is that we do this task, we solve this task to be able to drive some uh, clinically useful quantitative measurements, such as the volume of our blood uh, pool. That way we can make better diagnosis decisions. Uh, that can be error prone due to inter-observer variability and it can be time consuming because every annotator has to go through these volumetric images slice by slice and they have to process it uh, over uh, many cases. So what we did in this work is basically we put a, a standard uh, feed-forward vanilla network that is uh, either VGG16 or UNET, as you like, uh, uh, that was trained with uh, thousands of cases. Um, UK Biobank is a big cohort uh, in the UK uh, where so far we have collected a, a data set in the order of uh, tens of thousands of data. And that way uh, we are able to train this model uh, with 5,000 cases. They're coming from uh, eight different annotators. And the, the results were quite uh, striking. So when we look at the results uh, qualitatively, we actually see that the top and the bottom row do not show much difference in terms of the uh, visual assessment. So we see the ventricle and the atrial segmentations obtained with auto algorithm and the manual annotations. But when we look at the qualitative, quantitative results, uh, this is quite striking. So what we're seeing here is basically the, the difference between uh, uh, manual annotators and the difference between the automated algorithm versus uh, average uh, annotator. So we see that the first column shows that the algorithm is actually sometimes more consistent uh, with the annotator than the difference between the annotators. So this shows that actually for a, for a problem where the, the boundaries are well defined and we don't see large deviations, uh, we can actually automate this process quite well and it, this is a very reliable approach. But that might not be always the case. So this will be the first work that I would like to spend some time on. Uh, it's about learning anatomical constraints with this model. So this approach might be useful when we see some outlier cases. Uh, when I say outlier cases, by the way, do you have any questions so far or do I, am I moving too fast? Please give me feedback. Okay, all right. All right. So the, the problem here is uh, some of you might already know um, when we acquire cardiac MR images, uh, because of the moving, it's a moving organ and we would like to image this organ in both volumetric sense and also in time, uh, it, it, it basically takes lots of time and patients usually are asked to hold their breath for some time. And for that reason, these images are acquired in uh, stacks of slices, but the slices are quite uh, thick, uh, as you see in here when we look at in the true plane direction. 
and uh, because of that, there could be sometimes uh, inter-slice uh, motion and that basically uh, hampers the uh, quantitative analysis. Or similarly, in the case of uh, echocardiographic imaging, uh, there could be reverberations or like uh, imaging artifacts or, uh, or uh, shadowing uh, artifacts because of other structures uh, that might basically limit the view of the ventricles. So standard uh, models may not be able to cope with this kind of uh, imaging artifacts when the uh, imaging data is not self-sufficient for the analysis. How can we actually deal with that? So to be able to cope with this kind of problems uh, and produce anatomically meaningful results, we need to understand what is actually going in these models. We need to teach the models that they need to produce anatomically meaningful uh, results. And to be able to do that, we need to see the objectives. So what we commonly do is we train these models based on our pixel level loss. So when we do back propagation updates with the stochastic gradient descent, we tell the network, hey, look, look at this pixel and the error signal, and let's back propagate that. But it does not necessarily see the big picture. So to solve this problem, one has to analyze a larger context and generate the error signal based on that. What do I mean? For example, we collect these uh, input data, and then if we use standard uh, feed-forward network, this is what we obtain. And we actually ideally would like to be able to produce segmentations or, uh, or super-resolution uh, images, as in this case. Uh, and to achieve that, we need to um, teach the models the underlying anatomy. And to do that, uh, we're using autoencoders. So the autoencoder model uh, behaves as a regularization network. Uh, I think uh, this, this topic was covered about 10 minutes ago, so um, I can briefly uh, go over it again. The main idea here is basically autoencoder learns to uh, capture the salient information uh, present in the input data. As such, when we map this input data to a lower dimension representation, we should be able to reconstruct the, the input data as it is. So the input and output is supposed to be the same, but it has to be reconstructed through a low dimensional representation. And we also need to make sure that these models do not have large capacity to learn every single code and its corresponding representation. So there's like a, a balance, a trade-off in here. So this latent space is quite useful uh, because this basically captures the anatomical information that we are after. So I will basically show you how we can use this autoencoder. So the main idea is uh, we pick our favorite uh, segmentation model uh, and we segment this input image. We obtain a prediction and we know the corresponding ground truth uh, label for that. So what uh, we do normally is we define a cross entropy loss or a pixel level loss that basically trains the segmentation uh, model through the uh, partial gradients. But what we also utter is a, a a regularization term that is defined in the latent space. That encoder basically captures the big picture and teaches this model that, hey, you need to look at the, the big picture and make sure that what you produce is anatomically meaningful. That's the main idea. And can we actually generalize this to different domains? Like, um, we could maybe achieve this uh, through uh, some post-processing, but if we generalize this uh, autoencoder approach to a further a different model, then maybe this approach can be more useful. So to, achieve, to answer that question, what we basically propose is a TL network. TL network basically allows us to uh, map a pair of segmentation and intensity image to the same hidden space. And this model is trained end-to-end uh, -end, uh, and together like with these uh, Euclidean loss and the cross entropy loss. Uh, and its purpose is the following. When we have an inverse problem where we need to map an input image to a high resolution space, uh, the predictor network allows us to make sure that the generated intensity image is basically capturing the same latent code so that it's anatomically meaningful. Maybe I can show you some images. So this is a low resolution input image. Uh, if you use standard uh, cross entropy loss, sorry, standard L2 loss, uh, this is what we obtain. Uh, when we enforce the uh, regularization term, we see that the, the uh, epical boundaries are better captured and the ventricle boundaries are uh, more regularized. Similarly, uh, when we look at the ultrasound image, when the ventricle boundaries are not clear, uh, this image may not be sufficient uh, for the analysis. But if we enforce the anatomical constraints, we can actually make sure that the ventricle boundaries are fit to the distribution that we expect. Uh, we did some further studies on that. The main idea is uh, we wanted to see what this TL network actually is learning. Um, so 
we expect that this H should capture some local anatomical knowledge. Uh, but to, it's better to keep it in mind that this is not a generative model, uh, it's an autoencoder model, and uh, we do not assume any prior distribution for this H. A better approach could be, uh, for example, a definition of the prior with some uh, uh, assumed uh, knowledge like a, a multivariate Gaussian distribution and matching that uh, with a KL divergence where the distributions are tried to match with each other. But even without doing that analysis, uh, we analyze the distribution of this, uh, of this latent codes. We see that the histograms actually look Laplacian or a Gaussian distribution. And this can be actually achieved in some ways uh, through uh, data augmentation, and this is often known as a denoising autoencoder. When we enforce some perturbations in the input space of the segmentation maps, the network, in a way, tries to map similar images to the uh, common latent space in, the, in, the learn, this, uh, in this learned space. And that's why we basically achieve this like a single mode uh, distributions. Uh, when we do analysis uh, in this uh, latent space through sweeps, we see that the, the uh, shapes actually capture some local information in the apex uh, or similarly in the basal parts. And that performs to, that basically achieves a better uh, characterization of the, sh um, the shape in comparison to standard uh, PCA models. Uh, this analysis was done by classifying uh, segmentation images coming from different pathological groups. Any questions so far? I think I should take some breath. I have been going fast. <laughs> All right. So, so far I've, I've talked about uh, sensitivity of the models to imaging data. Uh, I briefly touch the sensitivity to different uh, distributions or scanner types. Uh, one thing I would like to talk about is how do we make sure that these models work on images coming from different um, quality types. So let's say that uh, we would like to use this uh, model on a data set coming from different sites, but the imaging quality may not be consistent across um, uh, different sites. So one problem could be image contrast or noise uh, can be different, or in some cases, the stack of slices that we acquire do not cover the full heart. So this might be quite a challenge. So we either try to address this problem with a model, or we try to flag up these cases and inform the uh, radiologists uh, at the site to be able to perform a scanning again. So one way of solving this problem is basically a machine learning approach. And in this paper, uh, we try to address uh, three types of uh, artifacts. One of them is uh, image contrast, the other one is uh, inter-slice motion, and the, the last one is uh, hard coverage. And these are the three most uh, major uh, artifacts we see in the uh, UK Biobank cohort, and it's always not easy to go through thousands of images and then select them one by one and categorize. So what we did in this work is um, we took images from short axis and long axis directions, and we trained an ensemble of decision tree models. So these were uh, structured trees where leaf nodes actually contain uh, 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 patch information. And the idea is we segment each data uh, in terms of the, um, the blood pool and the myocardium and do the analysis based on that. And this, this technique uh, is currently used in the UK Biobank cohort to flag up the cases and it's quite useful. So this was a, a very brief uh, overview of this work. And on top of that, I would like to talk about some of the work that I did um, uh, during the first and second year of my PhD. Um, and these are different topics where we can actually apply uh, machine learning models uh, in different areas. And one of them is uh, super resolution. Um, it's, a, it's an inverse problem. So uh, the main idea is when we image the heart, as I said earlier, um, we acquire low resolution data in the true plane. How can we actually make sure that we can collect a high resolution uh, volume by combining or aggregating acquisitions from multiple directions so that we can do better uh, quantitative measurements. Some brief uh, clinical context, maybe I can show you a figure. So the uh, short axis uh, CINE uh, stack data is uh, usually acquired like this, like uh, in an interleaving manner, slice by slice. And we do this uh, over time so that we capture the full cardiac phase. Uh, but when we look at the, the volumes in the true plane direction, we see that uh, this data is not uh, in high resolution. Uh, 
and this can hamper the subsequent analysis in terms of uh, volumetric measurements. So what we're after is, for given low resolution data, how can we actually reconstruct the high resolution uh, image? To be able to solve this inverse problem, we need to understand the forward model. And one common approach is, uh, this has been used in MR physics quite often, that the high resolution image is the model between the two is basically uh, explained as follows. The high resolution image is uh, convolved with a point spread function um, that is basically uh, convolved with a uh, motion uh, operator and that the data is uh, downsampled. And in the inverse approach, we have a short axis uh, stack data and the uh, cross sectional long axis images. How can we combine those two together uh, in the model to be able to produce a high resolution image. So this work was, uh, uh, I think, two, sorry, three years ago published in Mikai and presented uh, in Athens. The main idea was basically, um, we tried to learn with a CNN network, uh, the residuals and residuals basically capture the, the high frequency content, the difference between the high resolution and the low resolution data. So this is an easier problem to learn rather than regressing the, the original high resolution uh, uh, output. And the, some qualitative uh, results that I would like to show. So for given ro low resolution input data, if we use a standard linear interpolation kernels, we do not reconstruct the uh, epical boundaries quite well, but with the uh, CNN super resolution approach, we can actually see the ventricle boundaries very clearly. And we did some quantitative uh, comparison between these uh, reconstructed images uh, with respect to the original or ground truth high resolution data. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it is quite difficult to acquire uh, these high resolution data in clinical uh, practice due to very long uh, uh, breath hold uh, durations. And also, uh, this is not a uh, common technique because of the low uh, PSMR. So this approach uh, could actually help us to reduce this uh, acquisition time and uh, help us to achieve a good PSMR. So how, how does it help actually? So what we did is uh, we segmented the uh, anti-stoly uh, frames and uh, we tracked it uh, over time. Uh, that way basically we quantified the surface distances. And one particular thing we see is basically uh, with the linear interpolation kernels, uh, the, the boundaries are not well followed and the, the difference is highlighted here. So instead of using standard kernels, actually, we can use those uh, lightweight models to be able to reconstruct uh, high resolution images. Uh, that's the main idea. The different application area is, uh, that I would like to talk about is uh, image registration. Um, here, I'm going to discuss about how machine learning can be used in image registration. And these days, I think it's a quite a hot topic where researchers have been trying to solve image registration with, with neural network in terms of both learning uh, good representations and also learning uh, special transformer networks. This is a bit um, pre-deep uh, learning area, like I worked on it during my first year, um, but the ideas are quite similar and like it can be applicable to deep learning uh, methods quite easily. So a very quick uh, clinical context for Image-guided cardiac surgeries are patients usually undergo tomographic scans uh, that can be CT or MR. And in those images, usually uh, surgical plannings are done. And the main idea is we would like to be able to map those surgical plannings on top of um, interventional imaging um, protocols so that we can overlay uh, the two on top of each other. Here, basically, we're seeing the gray anatomical image overlaid on top of uh, green ultrasound data. And that way, basically, we can provide better surgical guidance uh, during operations. But this is not an easy problem uh, because of uh, the, the distribution differences are between the modalities. And sometimes some structures may be visible in one modality and may not be in the other or vice versa. So uh, it's hard to define an image similarity metric uh, between uh, these modalities. And it's quite challenging. It, was, it is still quite challenging, and it was. And it hasn't been under, uh, addressed quite well so far. So one way to address this problem, we thought about what we could actually capture in these modalities as common so that we identify the, the similarities between the two and that we can use that to drive an optimization. 
And one way of uh, capturing that is basically generating anatomical representations from each modality. So we call this approach as probabilistic edge map approach. And that is based on structured decision force. Uh, it is modality independent, and that does not require anyone to have paired multimodal data. So you could have um, annotations uh, obtained on each modality separately, uh, coming from different populations. And uh, we could train a, you could basically train different models for each modality, and then later the learned representations can be used to do registration without having paired um, uh, data sets. And that is a quite very fast approach and can be parallelized quite well uh, across trees. Uh, in more detail, what we do is basically uh, using a uh, overlapping uh, patches by sliding them, we feed them to a set of decision trees, and each leaf node uh, we aggregate uh, patch candidates. And through collecting many, many um, um, label votes, we avoid uh, noisy representations. Like we do not see many false positives in the segmentations. And this idea actually has been tried to be used in uh, neural networks as well. <coughs> Sorry for that. Uh, so what we do is basically in the registration, we generate a edge map representation from each model separately. Uh, and then the rest of the optimization can be done with, uh, with your uh, favorite um, uh, optimization technique. And in our case, for the transformation uh, models, we use uh, B-spline FFTs, and uh, the images were first aligned uh, using block matching technique. Uh, some qual qualitative results. So we see that the, yeah, I'm sorry for the, uh, the brightness of this um, slide. Maybe I can try this. Okay. So normally what we see is that the walls are uh, well aligned and these are uh, quite uh, crucial uh, uh, structures that we're interested in uh, in the surgeries. And similarly, when we align uh, the modalities, the MR and the ultrasound, we see that uh, very good uh, alignment uh, performance is achieved. In a follow-up work, we extended this approach to do um, ultrasound image segmentation. And I think you're going to work on this problem uh, today in the afternoon. So there was a challenge uh, organized um, in Mikai some years ago, uh, again, uh, by the same group. And uh, in that challenge, uh, we participated with a multi-atlas segmentation technique. And uh, these representations were used uh, to segment uh, ultrasound images. So same technique is used uh, to do registration and propagation of the segmentation labels. Uh, this work uh, was later extended uh, to regress anatomical landmarks. So structured decision force model uh, can be combined with uh, regression nodes to do uh, vote casting uh, for landmark locations. And uh, that way one could actually achieve uh, landmark locations uh, quite easily. Any questions so far? I mean, you haven't asked any questions. Am I too confusing or uh, am I going too fast? Yeah, I do not want it to be like a monologue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a question about uh, what you present about super resolution methods yes. before. Uh, from what I know, normally you need a registration step before applying the, the algorithm. Yep. And so, how di did you actually do the regist regist blah, 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 this word uh, inside your network yes. uh, or before? Yep. Uh, you did it inside your network? No, I, I didn't answer. Sorry. Uh, could you explain what we're registering? Like, what do you have in mind so that I can get um, I thought that you used three um, different slice of uh, low, uh, low resolution images oh, okay, I see. In, uh, in the three directions. I and see. then with interpolation and registration, you can reconstruct the yeah. high resolution image at the end. Yeah, and so in the point. case where you're using a convolute uh, network, yeah, good how point. do you do this? Yeah, so it's a good point. Sometimes the acquired uh, multiple data may not be aligned. So I'll just rephrase the problem. So what we discuss is we acquire short stack stack and then cross-sectional images. Um, we know from the DICOM information that uh, they're more or less should be aligned specially, but that, that might be always the case. Uh, and in that case, the feature maps that we extract in the network may not uh, overlap on top of each other. So how do we deal with this problem? So there are several ways of uh, answering this question. In this particular work, what we did is uh, 
we did it as a pre-processing stage. We use a standard registration approach to align them and then pass them to the network. But this is not. This may not be the most elegant way. So there could be several ways of uh, handling that. One could address this problem through pooling, but that might not be suitable for inverse problems. Or one could try to address this uh, through um, special uh, transformer network in the early stage of the network. Another problem that might arise is uh, basically uh, the interslice uh, motion. Uh, and that might make the job of the network to regress the values uh, difficult, right? Uh, and one could like uh, try to formulate this as a special transform network uh, across slices with um, in-play motion parameters. Uh, that can also make the approach more robust. It's better to form. It's better to parameterize the model this way rather than expecting the model to regress to high-resolution data uh, from uh, from the beginning till the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, there are other questions. Yeah. Uh, hello. So normally, when we use autoencoders uh, for a task from image to image translation or reconstruction, uh, you had showed that uh, you used for uh, improving the resolution. So it is said that autoencoders uh, provide, I mean, give output as blurred images. Uh, because of the loss or the way you define autoencoders. But uh, means in the slides, it was like uh, you used it for improving resolution. So is it, uh, is it that you used a different type of a loss function or uh, like how did you tackle this problem? Okay. Um, so the question is, normally when we use autoencoder, the quality uh, tends to worsen, and, uh, but we use it in super resolution to improve the quality. So how do we answer this dilemma? So this is the question. I think it's a good point, thank you. Uh, there's something important to uh, uh, clarify. So the blurring in autoencoder can be caused by different reasons and it may not always necessary to, uh, to hold. So it usually happens in variational autoencoders because of the, the weighting of the KL divergence and the reconstruction loss. So if one weights the KL divergence that tries to match the priors more than the reconstruction, that might tend to blur, but we make sure that we have a good matching between the distributions. In our case, we didn't use that on purpose because we're using it just for regularization rather than interested in the prior space uh, alone. Uh, and in the case of a uh, super resolution, the answer totally depends on how much weight you give uh, to each uh, training objective. So if you do not, so I see it as a spectrum, like on one hand, you have a data-driven approaches, on the other, you have pure, uh, uh, shape-driven approaches where you don't rely on the data. So where you want to operate totally depends on how you balance these uh, loss terms. And in case of uh, data is not reliable, sometimes you may need to push towards the uh, data regularization side slightly higher. Does it answer your question? All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. Another question? No, maybe I have one, okay. uh, just one very quick. So at the end, you show us uh, that you perform registration between uh, different modalities with your random forest yes. approach. So you extract edges thanks to random forest, and then you perform the registration. Have you seen in the literature a method that tried to do the same but using deep learning? Uh, do you have any ideas on that and about the difference in terms of, of, of accuracy that you can get? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> so, two, two answers. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, back in the days, I tried to generate these uh, structured edges uh, with neural networks. Um, I think it was called a holistic nested edge detector, uh, a paper published from uh, UC San Diego, I think three years ago. Uh, the problem was that because of the cross entropy loss, uh, the generated uh, edges were not smooth enough, as in the case of structured forest, uh, because cross entropy tends to like a push the uh, distributions towards uh, the ends. Uh, that didn't work uh, well. But uh, this year in Mikai, uh, we submitted one paper that basically does the image transformation network, like learning a representation uh, together with a spatial transformer network. Uh, so uh, similar approaches are possible, and that will be basically presented in Mikai. Yeah, I mean, this is still a submission, but uh, yeah. Okay, it's really ongoing work, so um, can see on that. Yeah, but I, I think it's possible. And the cool thing is that uh, these learned representations can be later on used uh, in a favorite uh, registration algorithm. So 
the old standard registration algorithms are actually uh, SGD optimizers. And um, as long as we have good representations, uh, we can actually achieve very good results with these optimizers because we know that uh, they tend to the minima, similar to the uh, neural network SGDs. Yeah. Okay, because I, I'm asking that question because with your method, so you're extracting ages, but depending on the physics, uh, you will not see exactly the same structures depending That's if true. you're working in ultrason or MR. So it could cause some difficulties then when you do the registration. Do yes. you agree with that? Yes, I agree. With that. Okay. The, 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 to answer that uh, question, what we did back in the days is uh, we used a robust optimization that basically uh, chunks the residuals uh, that are higher than some expected value. Yes. And those are most of the time the missing uh, edges because of shadowing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, excellent. Maybe uh, I think right. you can. Go Do on. you know how much time I have left? I don't want to overrun so that uh, everyone can go lunch. I'm asking to the bus. At 35, it would be great if you can stop so we can have also a question. OK, so I have 20, 20 minutes. minutes. OK. Yeah, perfect. Would it be OK for you? Would it be OK for you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Minutes? Sure. Okay. So I think this is the last uh, research work that I will talk about. And then I will talk about something else. Um, uh, so this was published uh, last year in Middle Conference. It was the first uh, time that conference was organized in, in the Netherlands. And that was presented as an oral presentation. And then later on, we extended this work to, uh, to a journal uh, paper uh, that was published uh, about two, three months ago. Uh, it's about attention modeling. And I would like to give you a very quick uh, overview. Sorry for this. So, what we commonly see in computer vision is when we try to solve uh, instance segmentation or uh, instance localization kind of approaches, researchers uh, tend to solve the problem uh, in a divide and conquer uh, sense. So what I mean is that we try to first identify where the objects are in the images, and then with the extracted features, we try to either classify or we try to segment. Um, there is some redundancy in these kind of approaches, and there might be, uh, for example, in the case of a uh, auto context, where similar set of features are used, or similar set of uh, convolution parameters are used uh, in a redundant way uh, over multiple times. So, better approach will be to make use of the features in a very compact way, so that uh, we reduce the model parameters to avoid overfitting, and we can also make uh, use all the features in a way that uh, we can compute these uh, results uh, in a short amount of time. So we try to address that problem uh, through attention modeling. And uh, attention modeling has been used in natural language processing uh, uh, for the last uh, five years, I would say, uh, starting from uh, Google's uh, transformation model. So the main idea is um, attention models provide contextual information uh, depending on the hidden state of the LSTM model. So depending on the context, uh, attention model tells the, uh, the, the base network to where to focus on in the image. It basically disambiguates irrelevant features for the given task. For instance, that we're trying to make a, uh, we're trying to synthesize a text from this uh, medical data. And I think that's a very important problem currently that we want to say, let's say that left kidney is scaring. And in our case, the attention model output basically characterized by the, uh, the, the words that were output uh, in the previous stages. And that basically characterizes the model to focus on the, uh, where the next step is going to be. And how does it, uh, how could actually uh, help uh, the CNN architecture? Um, and uh, how can we use this in a feed forward uh, manner? So one idea that we came up with is that if you take a standard unit approach, uh, can we actually use the um, global feature maps to disambiguate uh, local features? So the idea is the feature maps obtained in the course resolutions uh, can guide the, the skip connections in a way that uh, it suppresses the irrelevant features uh, for the given task. And that way, we can avoid our false positive predictions, both in segmentation and classification. So here, I will basically introduce you to the notation. Uh, XL L donates to the uh, current layer or the, the uh, scale in the uh, model. Uh, G is the gating signal. This is the global context information that sees the bigger picture. And X is the local information. And X hat L is the uh, suppressed uh, 
uh, feature. Maybe I can first show you what I mean. Uh, so what we do is basically we want to, let's say, segment our kidneys. And the attention maps basically focus on uh, the kidneys. And it basically suppresses rest of the features uh, coming from the uh, background region. And how do we achieve that? So the idea is uh, within the attention gate, we have the input feature and the corresponding gate uh, gating signal. And these are defined in a dance map. They're not like a one dimensional things. They are uh, 4D tensors, or it can be 5D in the case of, uh, in the, case of uh, uh, the 3D imaging. Uh, and what we do is uh, we use a standard uh, concatenation based approach. So the idea is uh, we sum up these uh, gating signals after linear transformations and they're mapped through uh, nonlinear transformation. And the main idea is at the end, we try to obtain alpha signal that basically is range between zero and one and that, that defines if a feature is gonna be passed through the skip connection or it's gonna be blocked. And once we achieve that through sigmoid, we basically map the or the suppress the uh, irrelevant features in the Excel. And that way we basically clean out the features and that way we can avoid the false positive predictions. In the uh, context of uh, image classification, I think the user case is slightly different. So what we normally do in uh, image classification is uh, we do pooling of the feature maps to update to reach a, a single class, but uh, not all the features or the regions within the image might be useful and that might cause some interruption or there could be some uh, error signal rising because of that because we do not we're not interested in uh, the background information most of the case for example if you would like to classify this uh, fetal ultrasound image the background information may not be usable and there might be some non-positive uh, signal in there so instead of doing average pooling one idea is that with global signal we can do adaptive pooling and that way we can aggregate the only the useful features out to make the prediction. And that actually helps slightly. And it does not introduce uh, any significant uh, computation costs. And when we look at these uh, gating structures, actually what we see in these ultrasound images is it focuses on the texture uh, within the skull. And similarly for cardiac segmentation, it only aggregates the features uh, coming from the four chambers, for example. Uh, that's quite interesting. So, this is the end of uh, the first part of my presentation. And uh, I will try to kind of wrap it up uh, in the second part. About like how we actually uh, use these uh, research outputs in industry and what are the challenges. And sometimes the two might be slightly different uh, and most of these metrics kind of work well in our test data, but may not be applicable to thousands or millions of images that we're getting from different clinical sites. And as a researcher, we, we, I personally think that we need to make sure that uh, these research outputs are actually useful in this standard uh, clinical setting and that can, we can help uh, clinicians. And this is what we're trying to do at HeartFlow, uh, where I'm working uh, as a research lead at the moment, besides my academic enrollment. Uh, so I'll give you a brief uh, clinical uh, information. Uh, we're trying to identify coronary artery disease. And uh, in particular, we're trying to spot uh, blockage regions uh, within the coronary artery trees, which are often referred as uh, stenosis. And that can be uh, deadly, uh, depending on the, um, the significance of the blockage. And uh, it might often require uh, surgery or medical treatment, depending on the severity of the problem. Or if it's not a, a serious problem, patients are usually referred to uh, uh, to visit uh, six months later. And to do this decision uh, in the current uh, clinical workflow, what is done is an invasive uh, cat lab. In the procedure, uh, a catheter is inserted uh, through the uh, arteries and analyzed uh, uh, through the whole vessel tree to see if there's any significant blockage or not. So within the, uh, within the organization, what we're trying to do is we try to identify this blockage using uh, non-invasive only CTA, coronary uh, CT angiography data uh, in a non-invasive manner. So the main idea is we collect the CT data, we build a uh, anatomical model through segmentation, 
and we perform the, the blood flow uh, within the uh, vessel tree to be able to do the, um, the diagnosis. So what is interesting in here that I would like to mention is uh, there could be many different variety of uh, data that might, one might receive uh, in this workflow, like data coming from uh, Asia, from the US, or from the UK. And we see very big uh, quality difference uh, between this uh, information. And the, there could be difference uh, in, uh, in terms of the uh, populations, like not every heart is the same. So how do we actually deal with the problem? So I'll first talk about uh, the model itself. So what we do basically to solve this problem is we first extract the, the center lines of the vessel tree, and then we perform a lumen segmentation along this uh, vessel tree uh, using the deep lumen algorithm. And this is a basically a standard uh, unit model that is learned on uh, thousands of uh, cases. And later, uh, when we receive a 3D CTA data, uh, we basically deployed it on that case and uh, tried to generate a uh, candidate tree. Um, so one of the main challenges that we're facing here is basically uh, we need to make sure that this model can be deployed on uh, data coming from different sites and that requires us to select our data sets, training data set very carefully so that uh, we capture different distributions and we try to do very uh, rigorous uh, sensitivity analysis and that includes uh, regression testing as well. Uh, at test time, after the models are tested, what we do is we feed these uh, input images and now we get lumen annotations. Uh, it's based on a, a standard uh, 3D segmentation model, uh, a unit. And, and here I'm basically showing uh, some qualitative images. So this is the lumen segmentation. This is the uh, corresponding uh, center line extraction. And once the center lines are extracted, uh, we use the deep lumen algorithm, which was published uh, uh, about two years ago in NIPS conference. So this model is, uh, in a way, rotation uh, equivariant. And the cool idea here is basically, as we progress along the uh, vessel trees, uh, we try to regress the, the diameter of the lumen. And in the medical setup, it is quite important to know how confident we are about the predictions so that uh, we're better prepared for the uh, failure cases. And this deep lumen architecture is able to cope with that uh, by formulating the output space as a Gaussian mixture model. By looking at the, the uh, density uh, predicted by the model, we can have a better understanding about the confidence measure. So this way we can flag up difficult cases and uh, cope with the outliers easily. Um, on top of that, uh, another problem that we're working on is uh, related to CT quality assessment. Uh, this is quite a hot topic for us and uh, I think for the researchers as well. So the main idea is not all the images that we uh, acquire or receive might have the same quality. So there could be different uh, score types depending on the contrast or the motion in the CT data. How do we deal with this problem? So in the current setting, we do not have local uh, quality scores for each case and the, these artifacts can manifest themselves on a local basis instead of a global scale. So one can basically try to formulate this as a multi-instance uh, learning problem where we are giving a bag of uh, samples. We know that there are some negative and positive samples, but we do not know uh, the label of each sample, but we know that the bag has contains both or only one of them. So uh, this is one way of uh, tackling this problem and we have been working on this for a while. So uh, today I've talked about in general different application areas and I think this is the uh, last slide and we can go to lunch. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, so, the main, the main um, message that I've been trying to give today is basically uh, we can try to solve uh, medical problems, many different problems by applying deep learning techniques. Uh, they work well quite most of the times uh, on our test data, but we need to make sure that uh, they can be actually deployable on large scale uh, cases and we need to be always careful about the outlier cases and how we can actually tackle them. And I think that's the way to move forward uh, to be able to make use of them. We can basically achieve good results even with a uh, standard uh, CNM network. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Zen. So we have time for questions. Is there any questions? I have some, but okay, we can start. Hi. Um, 
Thanks for the presentation. According to you, what do you think, uh, what kind of problem in medical imaging or cardiac imaging um, cannot be solved by uh, a generic model, say a UNET or a VGGNET, and lots of well annotated data? Uh, as you know, I mean, if you want to segment an organ in, uh, in a CT image or an M MRI image, if you have well, I mean, lar a large enough data set that is, was well uh, curated, then probably UNET is pretty much going to give uh, you know, good results. Same with uh, tumor localization and uh, recognition. Uh, if you have enough uh, well annotated data, it's probably a generic model is going to work well. Now, if when we look at the uh, publications that uh, are coming out, they're pretty much uh, you, you know trying to answer those questions with a small data set. What do you do if you have a small data set and then um, a poorly annotated data set or a weakly annotated data set? But at the end of the day, I mean, if you have a if you had tens of thousands of patients that were all well annotated then you can solve most of the problems that we are currently facing. According to you, so I'm repeating the question, uh, what kind of problems cannot be solved uh, with lots of well annotated data and a generic model? So, hard question to answer. That's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with the point that uh, you're making. Um, I think we saw the big jump uh, two years ago with the UNET and VGG networks. And from that on, the research has focused on some polishing work to make small improvements on top of that. Um, I, I personally think that if we could capture the full training distribution, full data distribution, most of these models would perform quite good. But in practice, that may not always be the case. So I think the research is slightly focusing on how we can actually cope with this problem in a smart way. So I see the neural network research and the model design as more like coming up with a smart parameterization. So we could have a problem and uh, there could be multiple different ways of uh, parameterizing the models to solve that problem, but they may not always uh, be the smartest one. So back in the days, like before CNNs, we had actually uh, fully connected networks they actually can replicate what CNN does. Like uh, we can formulate a CNN with a fully collected network, but it's not the same parameterization. One of them has millions of parameters and the other one is a compact representation. And that allows us to handle the, this data problem in a, in a good way, right? So I think the research should focus on coming up with a better compact parameterization to learn what we actually need to learn. Like learning the intermediate uh, hierarchies and the structure and the relationship between the, uh, the objects instead of learning end-to-end uh, -end, uh, learning. Uh, so since if we could have very large distribution from the training data, then I think we could solve many problems, but that's not always the case. So one way of dealing with this problem is, I think, as I said, learning better parameterization. And with all this work on LSTMs or uh, with the CNNs, that was, that's what we did actually. And uh, the next jump will be ba basically better parameterization, like as in the case of capsules, which learns the concepts rather than learning the um, uh, the antian relationship. And that way, it basically can capture the same problem with f many f like a fewer parameters. So I think this is the right way to go to make this problem simpler and reduce the demand for large data. Yeah. Thank you. It's a good answer. Thanks. Is there other questions? Okay, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question is with respect to the very beginning when you were talking about a <coughs> sorry, the autoencoder. Um, is it trained, is the autoencoder trained on a different set of data as the segmentation network? Uh, do you mean uh, in the context of this paper? The paper that I presented. Yes. Yes, it was. Yes. Okay. It was trained on the same uh, data. Same data or different? Uh, same training data. Okay. Yes. And is there a danger that because the autoencoder can basically give um, a perfect reconstruction in most cases, right? So is there a danger that um, it it simply doesn't really bring anything much because um, the ground truth so the, the ground truth will guide the segmentation to be near perfect. 
So obviously, if you project the, the predicted segmentation, it will be close to a point that you've seen in tr while training the autoencoder. Yeah. So uh, can you, I don't know if you can comment on that. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, it could push everything to the training data that we're observing, basically, that's the command you're making. Uh, these are a bit like uh, implementation ad hoc solutions that we do, like uh, to avoid these kind of problems. So uh, one way of answering this question is, one could actually design a PCA with a neural network by just putting uh, one or two layers, right, uh, without doing any nonlinearity. So I guess the answer depends on how much capacity we put in the autoencoder. Like, if I put millions of parameters, I can fully reconstruct these uh, segmentations with almost uh, zero loss uh, value. But if I try to limit the capacity to a lower number, that is not going to achieve the perfect segmentation, but it will try to learn some like a, a course level or like a salient information that PCA doesn't capture. It's like a non-new PCA. So that's what, how we try to solve that. Yeah. But I think you're, you're raising a good point, and I think a better solution will be maybe like uh, training the autoencoder with a separate large uh, segmentation data set that is independent of the um, uh, on the uh, the segmentation training data. Um, and the other thing is, um, how do we know that actually these models generalize well to different pathological groups? This is also another challenge that uh, I think the answer depends on where we want to operate in this uh, spectrum that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Is there other question? Okay, I have one uh, concerning the intervariability uh, that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. So you say with MR segmentation from the result that you get, you were lower uh, than the intervariability of the expert for the segmentation task, correct? Am I right? Lower in terms of? Well, the value that you show really mm -hmm. at the beginning of your presentation, you say that the score that you obtain were very competitive uh, if you compare it with the variability between yes. two experts. Yes, that's what I said. Usually, uh, it's, so it's an open question. Usually, um, it's very difficult to have reference database, and we are very happy when we have one with only one expert that has done the manual annotation. Mm -hmm. And we learn from that, and then what we do is that on a, on a sub part of the database, we will ask over experts yep. to also do segmentation so we yep. can compare with the inter expert. But we never really try to learn these uh, inter-expert variabilities during the training phase. Yes. Because we only have one expert. Yes. Um, it's a question I'm asking a lot uh, those times. Do you think that it would be interesting also to ask for the full database, all the experts to do the annotation, <coughs> and so to try to take this into account during the learning phase uh, to well, somehow to try to improve the results? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, maybe we can try to think about like together like possible scenarios. So let's say that we have a set of annotators. Uh, some are good at task, some are bad, and some are average. Uh, if we use the training data coming from a bad annotator, we know that our model is going to be upper bounded by the performance of this bad annotator, and we will never, we will probably not reach the performance of the inter observer variability. Uh, on the other hand, if we train our models with annotations coming very good annotator, we know that on average we should be able to outperform uh, the low performing annotator. Uh, I think there, there has been some work recently on modeling the performance on annotators and, and incorporating that knowledge uh, within the training so that we weight the samples uh, or the back propagation of these uh, accordingly. So it's a bit more like a collaborative filtering, like understanding how things are related to each other and how, we, how much we can rely on that data. So there's so. already works on that? Yeah, I can point you that after the ah, talk. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Really but great. I think it's an interesting topic, and uh, every industrial company is interested as well. Yeah. OK. So it's just to, to go back a little on that. Uh, in that case, where we would have several experts that annotate the same images, then we would provide our network with uh, different solutions for the same image. Wouldn't that really uh, complicate the task instead of uh, having some kind of regularization effect on, uh, on the quality of the segmentation? Uh, why do you think so? Well, because I think that uh, when you do supervised learning, you're actually trying to, uh, to do some kind of mapping mm -hmm. in between your solution space and your image space, your input space. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a free 
uh, different solution for the same input, well, you might you may truly uh, complicate uh, the task okay. for your network. Now I understand the question. So the question is, we have intense data or any training data, um, and then we have annotations that we see very large variability, and wouldn't that actually hamper the performance instead of we could actually use one set? So I think we are actually saying the same thing, uh, the three of us. Uh, in that case, we have actually bad quality, low quality, and the model will perform somewhere in between, right? It will converge somewhere, but like, it will not perform as good as the, one of the best annotators within that set. Uh, so that's what we were saying, actually. Instead of that, can we actually model the quality of these annotators and focus on more? Because if you don't do that, it's going to basically uh, converge towards the average. So it's, it's, I agree with what you're saying, and it's actually aligned with what we said. So that's my understanding. The best thing would maybe to have a data set that is consensual, uh, Ah, uh, yeah, that, that could be done as well. Yeah, you mean like a sample like Staple that uh, we out, out, like select the outliers and we ignore them and we only choose a subset that is we rely on? Uh, yeah, because maybe yeah. one annotator would uh, provide more, um, uh, how to say, very different result on his own annotations. And yeah. maybe if we had several cardiologists, for instance, or experts have um, agree on cases, then maybe it would actually simplify the task. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I think we can s thanks again the speakers.